Thank you for listening, downloading, sharing, subscribing, commenting, donating, and praying for us. And for going to BrotherLance.com to get the free PDF of this teaching. BrotherLance.com Passover and the Lord's Supper. Since today we'll be learning about the power of the Lord's Supper. We'll unlock the connection of the Passover and foot washing as it pertains to the Lord's Supper, often called the meal that heals. It can also be the meal that can inflict sickness and even death. We'll tread very carefully through the facts and seek the full blessing of this sacred rite. When performed with a humble heart before God is one of the most powerful weapons of our warfare that we can utilize for our victory. So without further delay, let us look deep into this amazing blessing. Dear Heavenly Father, praise you. Thank you so much. We're here again. And so thank you for allowing us to make it this far and for taking care of us and getting us through the past couple of weeks and watching out for us and all your many blessings, to not just us and our family, everybody in our group, Father. And so we glorify you. We thank you. Give us the Holy Spirit, God, your truth. Help us understand what we're about to read about the Lord's Supper, Passover, and foot washing and how they all relate and uh, help us to be able to walk in a newness of life every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. All right. Weapons of Warfare, the series part five. So without further delay, let us look deep into this amazing blessing. Okay. So John six fifty three through 58. Then Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourself. Whoever partakes of my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who partakes of my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live through the Father, so he who partakes of me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as the Father ate the manna and died. He who partakes of this bread shall live forever." Okay, so it's a pretty bold statement, and we're going to go a little more into it a little bit. So let's look at and just jump right into the understanding Passover, okay? And so we have to understand Passover so we can understand the Lord's Supper. It says the purpose, who? Overall reason, Exodus eleven seven. So Pharaoh would know how the Lord does place a difference between the Egyptians and the Israels. So uh, uh, Israelites. So we know that the whole reason for Passover, is told us in Scripture, is to make a separation, of the godly and the ungodly, those who love God, those who don't love God. That was the purpose of Passover, right? That's what it clearly says. And it said the what? Exodus 12, 7 through 8 says, Take the blood of the lamb and strike on the two doorposts and the upper doorposts, and you'll eat the flesh in that night and the unleavened bread. Right. So in order to be on the side that doesn't die, you had to take the uh, the blood of the lamb and put it on your doorpost. Right. And let's look at the why. Exodus 12, 11 through 13. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass over the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn, both man and beast against all the gods of Egypt. I'll execute judgment. I am the Lord and the blood will be a token upon the houses where you are. And I will see the blood and I will pass over you. Right. So what is he saying? The whole point in 11.7 is to make a distinction between the Egyptians and the Israelites, God's people, and those who aren't, right? And so now when he's coming over, the angel of death comes over, he makes, he sees the, 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 the distinction, right? Those who obey and those who disobey, obviously, right? So when, Exodus 12, 28 through 29, and the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. And it came to pass that at midnight, the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, right? And so the distinction is made that we found in 11, Exodus 11, 7, right? Okay, so let's look at the top of page two. So now we're going to take the Passover and we're going to connect it to the Lord's Supper. The great example of Passover, top of page two. It says, Passover was an example, a preview of greater heavenly gifts through Jesus. So Jesus, the Passover, the Lamb of God. John 1, 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, right? And then the next one, Jesus, our Passover, takes away our sins. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Purge out the old yeast that you may be a new lump, even as you are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed in our place, right? And so before I read my little note there, again, the original Passover was what? To create a distinction, right? A separation of two people groups. You know, you don't want to say the haves and haves nots, but you want to say those who obey and those who obey not, 
right? And so now we have in John 1, 29, saying, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes the sin, uh, away the sins of the world, because they knew that it was a sacrificial lamb. And then 1 Corinthians 5, 7 is, Behold, Christ is our Passover, has been sacrificed in our place, right? And so what was the purpose of the sacrifice in the Old Testament? The purpose of sacrifice in the Old Testament and Passover is so when the angel of death came, they'd be a, a go over you, right? And so what did you have to do in the Old Testament so you wouldn't die from the angel of death? You had to take the blood and put it on your house, basically. Right? Okay, so we won't go too much, but we'll read my note. It says, Christ, our Passover lamb, was sacrificed for us. Passover was a prophecy of what Jesus would do for us in accepting the sacrifice of Jesus in his pure, sinless blood as a replacement for our sinful flesh and blood. Right? To stand in our place. Right? And so we're going to look more into the symbolism now of Passover Jesus. Passover over Jesus, okay? A lamb without blemish, Passover, Exodus 12, 5. Your lamb should be without a blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take from the sheep or from the goats, right? And then Jesus, 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19, knowing that you are not redeemed with the corruptible things, silver or gold, from your vain manner of life handed down from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, right? So the Passover lamb had to be perfect. They had to be separated and they watched it and they made sure there was nothing wrong with it. And it was healthy and it was separated. And so here we have Jesus, a lamb without blemish and without spot. There was no sin in him. Right. So he, he was a perfect lamb. Right. OK. Next one. The burnt death of the lamb. Passover. Exodus 12, 8 through 9. And they shall eat the flesh in that night and roasted with fire and unleavened bread. They shall eat it with the bitter herbs. Do not eat of it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted with fire, its heads with its legs and with the in, inward parts. Right. So the Passover lamb had to basically be burned up. Now, if you get, you know, barbecue, you usually don't cook the innards when you cook barbecue. Right. You remove out the intestines and stuff but jesus god was like saying listen you're cooking the whole thing and you're eating it too all right next one jesus acts 2 30 through 31 therefore being a prophet and knowing that god has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body according to the flesh he would raise up the christ to sit on his throne and for saying this spoke about the resurrection of christ that his soul wasn't left in hades hell or the grave and his flesh didn't see decay right because he had to pay the sin which is the burn in hell Right. So the Passover lamb had to be burnt and Jesus had to go and pay the price of the sinner. OK, so first Peter three eighteen through 19 says, because Christ also suffered for sin once, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which he also went and preached to the spirits in prison or into hell. Right. And so here we have the connection that had to be spotless lamb and Jesus was spotless lamb. The lamb had to be burned up. Jesus had to go get burned up. Right. And so let's go to top of page three. Weapons of Warfare, part five, top page two. It says, eating the flesh and unleavened bread, Passover, Exodus 12, eight through nine. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roasted with fire and unleavened bread. And they shall eat it with bitter herbs. Do not eat of it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted with fire, its heads with its legs and inward parts, right? So they had to be eating the flesh. Now, Jesus says in Matthew 26, 26, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and gave it. Gave thanks for it and broke it. And he gave it to the disciples and says, take and eat. This is my body. So you had to eat the lamb. And so Jesus gives us a representation of his body through bread, right? And bread is cooked and burnt with heat and fire too, right? So it, it applies, right? And so we're taking physical things and, and understanding them in a spiritual manner. Because obviously, because like the Romans used to think that since the Christians kept the Lord's Supper, they were eating people. They didn't understand the spiritual representation. Now, the Catholic Church teaches that it literally becomes the blood of Jesus and it literally becomes, you know, the body, the flesh of Christ, which is, it's not true. And it's not what happens. It's a spiritual representation. You just like when you're baptized, you're not literally going in a grave. It's a spiritual representation of death and you come back out. So, anyway, so sprinkling the lamb's blood, the wine of the blood of Jesus, Passover. Exodus 12, 7, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorpost and on the lintel on the houses of which they shall eat it. Ge and so that's what they did with the lamb's blood, Jesus. Matthew 26, 27 to 28, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, All of you drink it, for this is the blood of my new covenant, which is poured out for many for the remissions of sins. And the next one, Hebrews 10, 
21 through 23, and having a great priest over God's house, let's draw near with the true heart in the fullness of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let's hold fast the confession of our faith without waver, for he has promised is faithful. And so here we have, they would sprinkle the blood on the doorpost or the entryways of their house, right? And so we truly only have two entryways in our body. We have our mouth and our nose, right? And so we have ears, but that doesn't go into our guts. Right, that goes in the sinus cavity, and so our, our we can breathe water and back through our nose. So we have basically this is our entry area, right? Now, ladies, you know they can have babies and stuff, but again, it doesn't get into the guts. It doesn't get into the inward parts of man or woman. And so um, we now take the blood and and drink it as grape juice, right? And then that's representing of that blood of putting it on the doorpost. So now when we right, said in Hebrews 10, 21 through 23, it says sprinkling, uh, sprinkled from an evil conscience, they understood what that meant, you know? And so now we're digesting the rep spiritual representation of blood, of the blood of Christ in what? We are the temple of God, right? And so this is one of those doorways. So we put the blood and the bread in, in the doorway, you know, which is the mouth, <laughs> You know, and so let's get next one. The purpose, Passover, Exodus eleven seven. So Pharaoh would know how the Lord does place a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. Obviously, we talked about that. And the next one, Jesus. Titus two thirteen through 14. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearance of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify to himself a special people, a zealous of good works, right? So what was the whole purpose? To purify a special people, right? So in Exodus eleven seven, it was to separate them. And so Jesus gave himself for us that he might redeem back and separate us to make us peculiar or special or different, not like the world. Okay, and the next one, 1 Peter 2, 9, but if you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for possessions, though, that you might speak of the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, right? And so there's our, there are those who remain in darkness, and they don't accept Jesus, and they don't obey Christ, and they don't obey God, but we're not called that, right? We're a chosen, a royal, a holy nation of people mm -hmm. separated, right? And this is one of those rites that we do to signify that we are different. Right. And so it's a blessed thing. It says the Lord's Supper. Please note the institution of the Lord's Supper was started on Passover. Having studied what we did above, the reason becomes obvious. OK, date and location. So what we want to show here is now we, we showed the, the correlation of the Passover and the Lord's Supper. Now we're just laying out that, yes, this was started at Passover. So date and location. Matthew 26, 17 through 19 says, now, on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain person and tell him. The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. The disciples did as Jesus commanded them, and then they prepared the Passover. So we, this is the proof that the Lord's Supper was started at Passover, okay? A couple verses later, Matthew 26, 26 through 29. As they were eating, Jesus took the bread and gave thanks for it and broke it. He gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. He took the cup and gave thanks and gave to them saying, all of you drink it for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the remissions of sins. But I tell you that I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom, right? And so this is Jesus instituting his supper, the Lord's Supper. And I put a note. It says, we know that Jesus is the Passover lamb that takes away sins. We also know that in John 6, 53, we are told, then Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourself. Now we must partake of the Lord's Supper to have the life of Christ within us. Without it, we will receive death and hell. But there is yet another reason why we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Let's read 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now we, we can see the twofold reasons why participating in the Lord's Supper is so important. To have the life of our Lord purchased for us with the, his own blood and to remember that sacrifice, right? And so it's a, it's a doozy right there. John 6, 53. Truly, truly, I say to you, so that's like saying, verily, verily, this is important. Like, listen up, guys. Mm -hmm. I say to you that unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourself. There are many Christians today who do not think it's important to take the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. It's his supper. He gets to tell you how important it is, right? Mm -hmm. And he's saying, if you don't do this, 
you have nothing. You're without me. Right? That's how important it is. Okay. So the Lord's Supper guidelines. Okay. So now that we kind of understand that that's a correlation between Passover and the Lord's Supper, that it was instituted on Passover and that we have to do it. It's not, it's like saying, uh, go and make disciples of all men and, you know, spread the gospel. The people think, well, we don't have to do it. No, that's a command. This is a command. Right, we're going to talk about another command that people don't do today, right? Here in a minute. It says the Lord suffers guidelines. Be in unity within the body of faith. 1 Corinthians 11, 18 through 19. For first of all, when you come together in the assembly, I hear the division exists among you. And I partly believe it. For there are also must be factions among you that those who are approved may be revealed among you. And then we read in 1 Corinthians 10, 16 through 17. Is not the cup of blessing that we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread that we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread. We who are, are many are one body, for we all share the one bread, right? So we don't want division. When you take the Lord's Supper, if there's division, hold off, okay? When you have to be in unity to do it, right? And if there's unforgiveness, hate, anger, frustration, division, you can't do it. You're gonna, we're going to talk about it. You're going to bring a curse upon yourself. Okay, let's know. Know the difference from a regular meal and the Lord's Supper. Okay, let me see. It says 1 Corinthians eleven twenty. Now, when you come together at the same place, you are not really eating the Lord's Supper, right? So they, they were getting together to break bread and just eat. And Paul's like, no, you need to make a distinction. There's a difference from just having your food, which we'll talk about in the next verse, and then the Lord's Supper. Don't, you know, the, the next verse kind of cracks me up. So we'll just read that one. It says, don't get drunk, nor, top of page five, sorry, top of page five. Don't get drunk, nor eat. It's just because you're hungry. First Corinthians 11, 21 through 22. For when it is time to eat, everyone proceeds with his own supper. One is hungry and another one becomes drunk. Man, what a church service. <laughs> Do you not have houses so that you can eat and drink? In other words, can't you eat your meals and get drunk at home? People, come on. Or are you trying to show contempt for the church of God by shaming those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I praise you? I will not praise you for this. And then 1 Corinthians eleven thirty four. 34. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that when you assemble, it does not lead to judgment. I will give direction about other matters when I come. All right. And so we have to separate the idea of, you know, booze cruise mentality of going to church. Like we're going to have potluck. We're going to drink some beer, apparently, or wine. They're getting drunk, you know. And so, but we have to separate the meals, right? So, uh, I uh, fortunately was baptized into a church that did it right and did it well and always separated, uh, you know, potluck from the Lord's Supper, you know, and, and didn't try to do this weird amalgamation thing. But anyways, it says, remember that you are proclaiming the death of Jesus for your sins. First Corinthians eleven twenty six, which we talked about a second ago. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Right. So you're remembering the sacrifice that was paid for you. Next one. Don't eat in an unworthy manner, but keep it holy. First Corinthians 11, 27 through 28. For this reason, whoever eats this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty out of the body and the blood of the Lord. That means you killed him. That it, It's going to be held to your account. So if you eat the Passover, uh, the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, you're going to be charged with the death of Jesus. Ouch. A person should examine himself first. Now, we're going to talk more about that in a little bit. And in this way, let him eat the bread and drink of the cup, right? So we should have self-examination, which we'll talk more here in a minute. 1 Corinthians 10, 21 through 22. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot take part in the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or are we trying to provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are you really stronger than he is? In other words, you can't play footsie halfway in, halfway out. You can't be, have half-heartedness like, hey, I just went from the club to the church. And soon I'm done with the church. I'm going back to the club. Love. You know, you can't do that. Right. And so we have to be very introspective, very humble and very thoughtful of what we're doing. Right. Because it's a blessing or it's a curse. If, if you do it right, it's a huge blessing. If you take it in an unworthy manner, you're cursing yourself. And we're reading that right now. Eating in an unworthy manner will bring judgment upon you. First Corinthians 11, 29 through 32. For the one who eats and drinks without careful regard for the body, eats and drinks judgment against himself. That is why many of you were weak and sick and quite a few are dead. Ouch. Mm. If we examined ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. Right? So what does that mean? You cannot sit down and take the Lord's Supper in a half-hearted, a haphazard manner. 
So we're in a pickle, aren't we? Because we can't do that. But Jesus says, if you don't do it, you don't have life in you. So you're in a position where you have to repent of your sins, get right with God, take the Lord's Supper, and then by doing it, you have life in you. Mm-hmm. So you <laughs> get gets rid of those 50-50 backsliders, doesn't it? Because if they try to do it to get life in them and they do it in an unworthy manner, they're speaking death and sickness upon themselves. It's a great divider, just like uh, the Passover, right? I try to fit in and make sure everything looks good. Right, like, oh, everything's just fine. But like, so we have the Passover, which was to separate, and now we have the Lord's Supper, which is to separate. That's awesome. Right, and so we have to understand what we're dealing with, okay? Okay, so next one. Uh, perform the Lord's Supper in an orderly manner. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty three. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. So you get this idea. This is a raucous crowd that they're like, <laughs> it's like they're having a Roman style barbecue and everybody's just stuffing their faces and getting drunk and acting the fool because, you know, the Corinthians. But anyways, <laughs> uh, you know, what are you going to do? But he said it straight. Okay. So the Lord's Supper without a curse. It says, after we read in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 28, for this reason, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Then we learn that for this reason, many are sick and are dead in 1 Corinthians 11, 29 through 32. For the one who eats and drinks without careful regard for the body, eats and drinks judgment against the self. This is why many of you are weak and sick and quite a few are dead. With this understanding, we can truly appreciate the foot washing ceremony Jesus performed at the Lord's Supper during Passover. Okay, this is why the foot washing is so important. So let's go to top of page six. It's another one of those things before we go into it. I listen to the stupidest like the Bible answer man or something. It's the dumbest thing. I mean, like the Bible no answer man. I'm like. I'm going to be nice. Anyways, um, they said that doing uh, the foot washing is the equivalent of today of mowing your neighbor's yard. Oh, that's just wrong. It's super wrong because it was just meant to be in service. No, it's not. Jesus tells us why we do it. We're going to read that and why it's so important and why it's so beneficial. In the church I got baptized in, they would always do foot washing before the Lord's Supper. And here we're going to find out why. Setting the scene. John 13, 4 through 7. He rose up from supper and laid aside his garments, and he took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel in which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, do you wash me? Jesus answered and said to him, You don't know what I do now, but you shall know hereafter. <laughs> so let's recap. Recap of what we just learned about the Lord's Supper. John 6, 53. Then Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourself. Okay, next one. Jesus now makes another profound statement concerning foot washing. John 13, 8. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. So now we got, if you don't eat the Lord's Supper... You don't have life in yourself. And if you don't let Jesus wash you, you have nothing to part with Jesus. That's right. Right. So how often are you hearing about the foot washing? Yeah. It's so unpleasant today. We don't like people's feet. But I mean, in reality, we have pretty nice feet in America because we wear socks and nice shoes. Mm-hmm. We don't walk out in the dirty roads all day and the manure like they did in Jesus's day. Mm-hmm. It's not that bad. You know, in the church I grew up in or got baptized in, they would have the women go to the women and the men go with the men. And then the married couples can go together and they have their own room to do it as a married couple, you know. And but like so it's really not that bad, you know, and we even had hot water and nice towels. I mean, you couldn't get it any nicer, (laughs) you know, especially back then where Jesus like taking off his own clothes to do it, Mm -hmm. you know. And so now we have you don't have life in yourself if you don't take the Lord's Supper. And he says, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Right. Okay. So let's keep reading. It says we see the profound importance of being washed by Jesus. Now we know this starts with baptism, but it does not end there. So now Jesus explained the intent of the act. John thirteen nine through ten. Simon Peter said, "Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head." And Jesus said to them, "Someone who has been bathed slash baptized only needs to have his feet washed." 
but is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you. So it says Peter was already clean, yet like we all do, he picked up spiritual dirt upon his feet. We are being taught that foot washing is a mini baptism. It is meant to clean us of the daily junk of our lives. We are baptized in, into the death and the resurrection of Jesus as stated in the book of Romans, right? So let's read Romans. It says, Romans 6, 3 through 4. Or don't you know that all we who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him through baptism into his death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in the newness of life. So I put down there, it says, Yet there is a buildup of spiritual impurity in our lives that can and must be washed away. We are told by Jesus to wash each other's feet, just like he told us to baptize each other. This will uh, accomplish the task, right? So let's read. It says, I'm doing a comparison here. So we're going to do with baptism. We're going to do foot washing. We're going to see what Jesus has to say about this. So Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus came to them and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I command you. Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we have a command from Jesus, go baptize. Right? These are sacred rites. Baptism is sacred right. Lord's Supper is sacred right. Foot washing is sacred right. Okay? These are sacred rites. These are things that we're told that we have to be doing. So let's look at the top of page 7. Now that we saw that Jesus just said, hey, baptize each other. It says, wash their feet. John 13, 12 through 15. So when he had washed their feet, put his outer garments back on and sat down, he said, do you know that I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord. You say so correctly, for so I am. I then, the Lord and the teacher have washed your feet. You also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. So. We're supposed to baptize. We're supposed to wash each other's feet. We're supposed to take the Lord's Supper. They're all interconnected. Okay? It says, now we know that foot wa- why foot washing is so important before you take the Lord's Supper. It washes away the buildup of impurity that life brings, preparing our hearts and spirits and souls to take the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. So we can repent and then get our feet washed, which is a mini baptism, to get rid of the spiritual garbage, and then take the Lord's Supper, and then we have life in ourselves, but then we won't get the punishment or the curse for taking it in an unworthy manner, right? Now that we know it's important, now that we know that there's baptism, now that the, the, in the mini baptism, now we know the Passover, the Lord's Supper, and that we have to do it to have life within ourselves, and we have to be washed in order to be a part of Jesus. I didn't want to just be oh, like, hey, guys, it's important, <laughs> and then walk off. <laughs> so these are some simple guidelines. You do not have to follow what I just wrote down here. But for people online, for people at home, for people want a starting spot, I didn't want to leave people in like, well, now what? You know. Mm-hmm. And so these are the kind of the guidelines we use at my house. And yes, I actually read these verses that I've written, you know, and that and so forth. And so, like, if you want a starting spot, this is it. Now it doesn't mean you're stuck in it. That means just be led by the Spirit and let the Lord lead you. You know, change things up, mix things, add things, do what you want. But I didn't want to leave people in a position where they're just like, oh, thanks, Lance. It's important. But now how do we do it? Okay. And so here we go. Steps and guidelines. No, some bless the bread and wine before the ceremony and some during the ceremony. Others will do each individual right before consumption. Our family will do it before the service. Do as the Lord leads you. Refer to the bread recipe at the bottom of this study for more information on blessing and disposal of the holy instruments. Also, this is just a suggested guideline to get you started. Okay. And so we'll talk about the blessings and all that stuff here in a minute. It says things to think about. One, our relationship with God. Are we holding back sin? Have we submitted our lives and completely to his will? Right? Two, our relationship with other members of the church and family. Do we harbor unforgiveness or do we need to go and ask for forgiveness? Right? The Bible says to live at peace with all men as much as it pertains to you. Some people you just can't be at peace with because they won't let it happen. But that but as long as it's up to you and you've done your part and you've forgiven, then you can, you're free to do it because some people just will hold you hostage. Okay. Don't let that happen. Okay. Number three, spiritual liberty and the work of Christ and what Christ has done. Okay. So this is how we do it. Read the following out loud. Let us get right with God. Second Corinthians 13, five. And like, so this is after we have everything set up, we're taking the Lord's supper. I pull out my Bible. I'm reading this. Second Corinthians 13, five, put yourself to the test and see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize regarding your 
yourself that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail the test, right? So I say, let us take a moment, examine our hearts before God, ask for forgiveness, submit yourself to his will, and love him with your whole heart, right? And so, again, these are just guidelines. You can do what you want, you know? And so... Some of these things I've recently added to the list when I was making it. Some of them we've always done, you know, just trying to be thorough here. So let us get right with people. So now we just gave ourselves time to think about God and where our hearts are. And if we want to disqualify yourself. So if you're in church and you and God's bringing something to your mind in your head and you, you can disqualify yourself. I've seen it happen in church. Well, people will pass a plate and they'll just raise their hand like, no, I can't. Yeah, praise God. That's how it should be. Mm-hmm. You know, and we don't look down upon them because they're being honest and sincere about their walk. And so at that point, we see that we should help our brothers and sisters in Christ, pray with them, encourage them, not look like, oh, they must have been doing something bad. Well, guess what? We're human beings. We all do stuff bad. Mm-hmm. You know, okay. Let's get over ourselves. None of us are great. All right. Let us get right with people. Matthew 5, 21 through 24. You have heard that it was said to an older generation, do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I say to you that anyone who is angry with their brother will be subject to judgment, and whoever is insults their brother will be right before the council. And whoever says fool will be sent to fiery hell. So then if you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your gift, right? Perfect. (laughs) <laughs> perfect you know and at this point you go okay you know maybe you're right with god you haven't done anything but you have somebody in the church you can get up and go to that person and say hey i love you please forgive me make amends and then go sit back down and do the lord's supper right what the last thing you want to do especially in a church environment is rush through the lord's supper right. you know you give people time you know you don't be like regimented soldiers like Hurry, quick, hand this out now. Do this now. No, it's a time of reflection. It's a time to be retrospective and think about your heart, your mind, you know, be sensitive to the spirit, you know. Okay, top of page eight. It says, let us take a moment and ask God to reveal who must be restored, who must restore broken relationships with. Let us seek and offer forgiveness freely as we have freely been given forgiveness. For as much as it pertains to us, let us pursue peace with those who will receive it. If you do not feel at peace with God and your fellow man, you're forbidden to take the Lord's Supper. Please refrain until restoration can be made between you and God and the people in your life. Okay. So at this point we're saying, let us now begin the Lord's Supper. First First Peter 1, 18 through 22, knowing that you were redeemed not with corruptible things, with silver or gold, from the useless way of life handed down from your fathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb, without blemish or spot, the blood of Christ, who was foreknown indeed before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in the last age for your sake, who through him are believers in God, are raised him from the dead and give him glory so that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing you have purified your souls in your obedience to the truth through the spirit and sincere brotherly affection, love one another from the heart fervently. So I put, take the bread, prepare to eat, then read the following. 1 Corinthians 11, 23-24, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was portrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this and remember of me. Take and eat the Lord's body. Remain silent for a time uh, for reflection. Now, guys, this is not a time to be hooping, hollering. Often in, in, in good church environments, you're going to hear crying. You're going to hear people praying silently or just under their breath to God, you know, it's a, it's a very uh, poignant time, you know? And so to some people that it's new, it might seem awkward. Don't let it be awkward. It's a beautiful thing, right? Cause you're coming as a body of Christ to reach your hearts out to God, receive that newness in life and to be a blessing to one another. Take the juice prepared to drink, then read the following. 1 Corinthians 11.25 In the same way, we also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup in the new cover, in my blood do this, as often as you drink it in memory of me. Take take and drink the Lord's blood, remain silent for a time of reflection. Okay? And said, closing remarks in Scripture reading. Psalms 111.2 uh, through three and nine. The work of the Lords are great, studied by all who, all who take pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious, and righteousness endures forever. He has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his, his name. So now read Psalms 118 out loud if you'd like, because that was one of the things they, I believe they did with Passover. And then close with prayer. You know, and so what have we done here? So we started off with pairing up. We did the foot washing. And so what I've seen in foot washing, and just so you guys know, it's a confession. The Bible says confess your faults to one another. So if you have a brother or sister in Christ that you have 
a good relationship with and aren't going to tell your junk behind your back, you know, that you will sit there and confess things to one another. Like I need help with this, you know, I'm struggling with that and, and back and forth, you know, and again, these are guys with guys, girls with girls or married couples. And, uh, and, and that way you can do that. And then you do the foot washing for that person after you, and then you pray with them again. And then they turn around and do the same thing for you. You sit there, talk to them, tell them what's going on in your heart and mind. They pray for you, foot washing, you pray again. You know, it's pretty easy. So, Question and answer. Who can perform the Lord's Supper? Here are some few helpful texts on why this is everybody's right and privilege. You can do this yourself. The main guideline I would suggest is that the most spiritually mature and advanced member lead out in service. And a male before a female, top of page nine, men have the responsibility of being spiritual coverings within the body of Christ. So if, if and when available, the most mature male in good standing should always lead out. If there is no one, then the most mature female in good standing should lead out. You know, and then, of course, in women's ministry, women always lead out in men's ministry. Men's always lead out. But uh, we are now the new temple of God. First Corinthians 316. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? Right. So we're the temple of God. We're also the new royal priesthood. First Peter 2, 9 through 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who in times past were no people, but now are pe uh, God's people. Who had not attained mercy, but now have attained mercy. Okay, so why this is so important to know that we all have this privilege and right as believers? Because there's certain sects of Christianity that teach only a priest can do it, only a, this person can do it. So, like, if you're a, a lady in your house, you could do it. You're by yourself, do it yourself. You know, if you're a guy over here, you could do it. You know, we just want to keep the spiritual covering of that, how it's layered in, in the body of Christ. You know, so if there is a, a male in good standing that is mature in Christ, he should lead out. Mm -hmm. Right. It doesn't mean a woman can't have part of it and partake in it, but there has to be a leader because that person is there helping represent Jesus. Mm -hmm. OK. And so we all have the privilege. Everybody has a privilege. Please do it. You don't have to have special teaching. You don't have to have like a certificate. You don't have to have anything. All you have to do is have faith and follow the guidelines given to us in scriptures. Right. OK. How often can you perform the Lord's Supper? We are told as often as we do it, so as many times that we are led by God, we can perform the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 11, 25-26. In the same way, he also took the cup off after supper, saying, This is the cup in the new covenant. Uh, sorry, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in memory of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until it comes. So he said, as often as you want to, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance to me. He says, I would suggest, though, do, uh, don't do do it so often as to make it common to the heart and mind. There's a danger of doing things for the sake of habit and losing all of its deeper meaning. Right. So be led by the spirit. Basically, if you feel like you need to do it once a week. Every other day, that's between you and God. There's there's no punch card. Like, uh, you know, you got your punch card filled. You can't do it. Or you're woefully lacking on your punch card. You know, do it as often. Now, it's good to do it, especially if you're feeling far from God or feel like God is far from you or you just don't feel a closeness that you desire. Well, that's a perfect time to be doing it because you're re-upping, you're reconnecting, right? Okay, so... Where can the Lord's Supper be given? Location of the modern New Testament church. Remember that many Jews did not believe Jesus to be the long-awaited Messiah. So it is prudent to realize that Christians of the New Testament, Jew and Gentile, could not hold Christian church in the temple. So as we see in many references, the church was within the home of the believers. So I put one example, Philemon 1-2, Aphira and our sister to Ar Archippus, <laughs> our fellow soldier, into the church that meets in your house. And so uh, I'll read all the references for the podcast. Romans 16, 5, Colossians 4, 15, Acts 2, 2, and Acts 5, 42. All right. So the churches were actually in their house. So people were like, no, you can't only do it at church. No, you can do it whenever people are together. So let's read that. So we also know that where two or more are gathered together in the Lord's name, Jesus is in the midst of them. Therefore, we have the making of a church service. It does not have to be in a designated building or place where there is faith in Jesus. The location is adequate enough for the exercise. So let's read Matthew 18. 20 for where two or three are gathered together in my name there i am in the midst of them right so any place is good enough where there is faith that's the bottom line if you have a heart of faith you are the temple of god any place it could be in a prison cell any place is good enough and any believer in jesus christ can do it you know as long as they do it in a worthy manner correct okay top of page 10 
Does it have to be unleavened bread and grape juice? So real quick, sacramental wine to the Catholic Church, if I recall correctly, has to have 18% alcohol. Why 18% alcohol? It's so it won't turn into vinegar, they say. And they only use like water and flour. Okay. Now we're not giving the we're not giving this guideline in scripture. Bread, wine, I use grape juice. Right? And I'm not going to definitively say one way or the other. The reason why I don't use grape juice is because it is fermented. Wine. Yeah, sorry, wine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And so because it's fermented. So we use grape juice and then we use the bread. Okay. So I want to add a quick note here. It's the Feast of Unleavened Bread during Passover, right? And so there is no yeast in the house, no leavening agent. That's why the recipe that we give here in a couple minutes has no leveling, leavening agent because yeast represented sin. And it also goes back to, you know, the fermentation process with the wine. So we use unleavened bread with no yeast and no fermentation to represent purity and cleanliness and righteousness that we are free from the bondage of sin and so the body of jesus of course was sinless therefore we don't use yeast which represented sin to the jewish mindset at the time in which jesus held the passover and instituted the lord's supper says, does it have to be unleavened bread and grapes? For when you don't have the normal supplies to perform the Lord's Supper, I would without fear use whatever I had on hand to perform the sacred obligation. Many such poor people around the world may only have water and crackers, yet I believe through prayer and faith, these instruments of opportunity will perform the needed function through our obedience to the call of God. Now, if you get to look at the persecuted church, there's people that have nothing. You think God says, nope. You can't do that. We're going to prove that here in a minute. No, 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 no. You don't have the exact right things. No, we do what we can do in obedience when we can do it. But if we're in a situation, you know, where there's no hope, there's no way of getting it. You're on the run, right? You're being persecuted and all you have is a saltine and some water from the creek. That's right. Grab what you got and do it. That's right. Okay. I 100% unequivocally believe you're good to go. And here's some Bible verses that I think prove that point. Pray over what you have in faith. First Timothy 4, 4 through 5. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be directed if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified through the word of God and prayer. So what you eat becomes sanctified, made holy, set apart through prayer. Okay. We find such an exception given to us by Jesus. Mark 2, 25 to 26, he said to them, Did you not never read what David did when he had need and was in hungry? And, and, he, and he and those who were with him, how he entered into God's house at the time of a, uh, Bartha, the high priest, and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priest, and, uh, and gave also to those who were with him? He's, <laughs> Jesus is sitting there going, Hey, guys. You, you're getting the cart before the horse here, mm -hmm. right? God is not without compassion. That's, right. That's why it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath day. It's lawful to bless and heal. And here he's, you know, well, I believe this is about the Sabbath too, but you know, smacking people inside the head is like, you need to get your heads right, <laughs> right? Because we are told in scripture, of course, this is before Jesus died in Christ, but he told the thief, very, very saying to you, you'll be with me in the paradise. Not that day, because we know Jesus went to hell, wasn't raised for three more days. There couldn't have been that day. Either way, sidebar. But he was not able to get baptized, but he was able to do what he could do, right? So there's Christians in like North Korea stuff that has no one to baptize them. Do you think they're lost? I do not think they're lost. I will refuse to think they're lost because they are walking in obedience to what they can do and to the life they have. And I totally believe that. And now we say that in the New Testament where people are like, have you been baptized? You know, received the Holy Spirit. He's like, no, we've been water baptized, but we've never received the Holy Spirit. Were they not Christians? They were Christians. They just never had someone pray over them to have the Holy Spirit. So what do we have to do? We have to live up to the light we have been shown and do everything within our power to do it according to the way God tells us to do it. That's right. You know, and if we go the, to the, the to the limit, like we can't do anymore, then by all means, rest in peace and what and pray for God to make ways for those things to come and pass. Right. So I put right here, it says, if I had what was called for and could attain such things, I would always put in the effort to do so. I believe we are required to do so. Yet if I do not or could not, I would fearlessly utilize what I had on hand. Right. And so we have to take our every opportunity. Right. Because everybody wants the what if everything to death. Mm -hmm. Right. Get get rid of the what ifs. How about you go to the max amount of obedience you can perform? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Now, how is someone in prison who has given their hearts and minds to God going to get out and get a, a water submersion baptism? Not happening. Am I going to hate on them because someone pours a cup of water over their head in faith? No. God understands. Don't think God is so like clueless, careless, and disconnected to the plight of a human being. He's not. Now, if he was out of prison and could get the water, then yes, you have to. You need to get fully submerged. And if you poured a, a cup of water on your head, I'd be telling you, you waste your time. That's not what the Bible says, but you're in prison. You know way out. Live up to what you can do. See the point? Okay. So, right here. Matthew. Uh, we find more encouragement to facts with the following verses, right? He said, Matthew 9, 27 through 29. And Jesus passed by there. Two blind men followed him, calling out, saying, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They told him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched his eyes and said, According to your faith, be it unto you. How much of that in life is applicable to us in our walk with God? Now, we can't faith our way out of obedience. That's not what he's saying here. But if you trust Jesus and you're trying to do what he tells you to do according to that faith, now, there's people like, well, that's just not my faith. Well, that's not what we're talking about here. Don't get it confused, right? If you believe that you're living up to the light you're showing, you're doing everything you possibly can do and going to the max as hard as you can considering your circumstances, then yeah, I would rest in peace. Now, if the opportunity came one day, utilize the opportunity. Okay. First Corinthians 6, 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of anything. Right. In other words, we have some grace. Right. Okay. Galatians 5, 18. If you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. First Corinthians 10, 30, 31. So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. So, according to your faith, be moved by the Spirit, live up to the light you've been shown, and reach out and sanctify and make it holy in prayer. You know, so take your water, take, I mean, maybe all you have is a Mountain Dew. Okay, I'm not going to hate on you because you're using Mountain Dew. Yeah, whatever you got, use that, because I know there's people out there that are dirt poor, and they can't go, well, Lance, I can't make that, and I can't do this, so I can't do it. No, 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 don't let that stop you, Okay. Don't let it stop. You know, when the time comes and you have the opportunity, by all means, do it the way it's described in the Bible. But until then, keep reaching out in faith. Don't give up. Right? All right. It says, if I had, um, that's the next one. Uh, okay. Here's a simple recipe. Okay. Now, this is like a, a little recipe, and we're going to talk about the blessing and getting rid of the leftover stuff. So here's a simple recipe to make unleavened bread at home. Wine. We use grape juice. We try to get 100% grape juice if available. Of course, we don't use wine because it is fermented, right? So unleavened bread. One-fourth cup oil, one-fourth cup water, and one cup of flour. Not self-rising flour as it has leavening agents in it already. If you prefer, you can adjust the amounts differently than written to get desired amount. Some people add salt. It's up to you. Okay, let's go to the top of page 11. Mixing the ingredients together. Don't over mix. Said knead the dough as gluten chains will form and make the dough harder. Mix just enough that it makes it become kind of like a cookie dough, right? It'll be kind of pasty, you know, but it'll work. So cooking. Say we pan fry the bread with oil, making little balls and then flattening them out like little tortilla shapes, each one being one serving size per person. We will talk in a minute why we do this. Or you can make a bigger one and break it apart. You can also cook them in the oven as a tortilla at 350 degrees for about 10 minutes until golden brown or entire until desired finish. Okay, the blessing. We take the little pieces we made in, in the grape juice already poured into the cups for as many participants partaking. Note, this is why we make single serving size pieces. The participants can crack and break the bread of their own pieces. And we can also ensure that only the bread being used will receive the prayer of dedication to, for the service. This is the same reason why we pre-pour the juice. We then say a prayer, sorry, forgot to be, de of dedication, uh, dedicating the bread and juice to spiritually represent the uh, blood of Jesus. And at this point, it becomes holy and sacred and must be treated as such, right? And so some people like at, at that, the church I went to, they had all of it poured out and they prayed over everything. OK, and then they brought it out and whatever they didn't use had to be disposed of correctly. We do it differently because we know how many people are going to do it. We make our bread and get our juice and then we pray over what we're using. 
-hmm. right? And so proper, properly discarding what is left over. If you don't pre-portion your serving sizes, you must discard the rest in the most respectable fashion as possible. Some will take what is left over and burn the bread, and then perform a drink offering to God by pouring the juice onto the ground. See Exodus 29, 36 through 41 and Genesis 35, 14. Needless to say, the bread and juice should never find its way into your trash or down your sewage pipes. You have dedicated to to be the representation of the blood of Christ and, and the body of Christ. So to take any of it and throw it in your trash, what are you doing? That's horrid. Or putting it down in your septic pipes. Now, not good. This is why we pre-portion. Now, some people might not be able to pre-portion, but like the church that I went to, they would literally take it out in a metal pan and burn the bread up mm -hmm. and then pour the rest out. Right. And to treat it with the utmost respect and honor. Okay. Said, what about the leftover dough that is not dedicated? This is fun part. Well, we make the rest of the dough that was not dedicated into a delicious treat. We pan fry the dough as before. Then while it is still hot, we cover them in butter and salt. It's really tasty. Just saying. <laughs> Oh, you're right, you're right. It's really good. So, as you can see, we have covered Passover, Jesus being our Passover lamb, and we have unlocked the new Passover through the Lord's Supper. In doing so, we can have life within ourselves through Jesus. Then we are covered how important foot washing really is and to have a part with Jesus in the King in his kingdom. We also covered the great warning of making sure your conscience is clean before God and man, so we do not become responsible for the death of Jesus, and ending with many other guidelines for the successful execution of the Lord's Supper. So, so what have we learned today? That you need to be doing foot washing. You need to be doing uh, the Lord's Supper. Okay, you have to be doing it. And you have to do it in the right humble heart. And the failure to do that, and I'm not saying you have to do it every day, every month, every three months, but you need to be doing it, mm -hmm. you know, in your life, somewhere in your life on a regular basis. You know, some churches do it every three months, some six, whatever. I'm not, there's not like... We're not trying to burden people down with a bunch of guidelines. What we're just trying to say is get it done some way, somehow, someday. Get it done. You know, and especially the foot washing and stuff. It's a beautiful thing. Like my, all my kids are under my spiritual blessing. So when we do it, we wash all their feet. You know, and then we make them, we all sit around in the kitchen and we all do the uh, the juice and the bread, you know, and it's a beautiful thing, you know, because they're under my spiritual covering and they're not of the age of reasoning. So I, I feel totally at peace letting them doing with us mm -hmm. because they love Christ. They love God, you know, and, and know how to worship him and keep his commandments. So, you know, it's one of those things. So if you're wondering, should I let my kids do it? Well, if they're spiritually mature enough to handle it and understand what's going on, absolutely. <laughs> you should absolutely let your kids do that. Even if they're not baptized, I would say absolutely. Yes, because you're teaching them the ways of Christ, right. you know, and again, they're under your covering, you know, and so you're, you're showing them the way how to walk before the Lord. And so you don't want to wait until they're like 18 and go, Oh, Hey, now we're going to do the Lord's supper. They need to grow up in it, you know? And so to them, it'll become a normal part of their life, you know, but they understand the Bible verses and the being read to them, that kind of stuff, you know, and why we're doing it. And so if you want to, you can always sit down and explain to them why we're doing it. And like little kids, simple terms, you know, you can do it in simple terms. And as they get older, you can do it in more complex terms, but so let's pray. Dear father, we praise you. We thank you for all you have or do for us. Thank you for this understanding of this wonderful way to one um, get our hearts right before you to understand that this is separate and make a difference between us and the world through our obedience so we can have life within ourselves so we can be clean and so we can walk in the newness of life and receive the blessings that you know like they said the meal that heals and but also to do it in a humble heart so we will not be cursed upon us and so we praise you. We thank you so much for this, Father. And I just feel, Lord, I want to make a special prayer. There's many persecuted believers out there who have a hard time doing anything, you know. And I ask you to bless them, prosper and be with them, encourage them, let them reach out in all the faith they have to do as much as they can do and not feel ashamed about it, Father, but understand that they're walking it out and doing everything in their power. So I ask you to bless them, be with them and encourage them too. And then bless the church in North America and help us get our act together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.